The Gilded Age, a term coined by author Mark Twain, spanned the last three decades of the 19th century. According to Twain, what seemed glittering on the surface was truly dark and corrupt underneath. It was one of the most dynamic, contentious, and volatile periods in American history. America's industrial capacity exploded, creating more opportunities for people to prosper, but for that to occur, it also meant that farmers and laborers would suffer. As the U.S.'s wealth grew, so did the gap between the rich and the poor. Business giants like John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie helped to transform business and pave the way for a new modern corporate economy. In spite of the increase in corruption, swindlers, ostentatious lifestyles of the rich, politicians whose price tag showed, and those who got rich quick in the post-war boom, there was also positive outcomes. These included powerful industrial production, westward expansion, urbanization, and technological growth at rates that would change the very fabric of the U.S. for the better. Water and the steam revolution were the factors largely responsible for industrialization in the United States between the 1830s and the 1850s. Water power, the world's most prominent supply of power, continued to be an essential power source even during the height of the steam engine popularity. The steam engine provided many benefits that couldn't be realized by those relying solely on water power, allowing it to quickly become the U.S.'s dominant power. From 1838 to 1860, steam power went from 5% to 80% of the total power in the U.S. Steam engines made it possible to easily work, produce, market, specialize, and viably expand westward without having to worry about the less abundant presence of waterways. People also didn't have to live in communities that were in proximity to rivers and streams. The steam engine gave birth to the railroad age. Railroads kicked the post-Civil War industrialization into high gear. The first American line was built in 1830 and was only 13 miles long. By the end of the decade, over 193,000 miles of track existed in the U.S., double the amount that existed in Europe at the time. The building, expansion, and rebuilding of the lines created a huge demand for steel. By the 1870s, the Bessemer steelmaking technology had reached the U.S. from Great Britain. The Bessemer technology melted iron ore at high temperatures in a furnace, producing harder, purer steel. This invention reduced the cost of production and produced better quality steel. By the 1860s, due to the railroads developing new model systems, elaborate bureaucratic systems were needed. The era's well-known robber barons, a term applied to businessmen who used exploitive practices to amass their wealth, ran and looted the railroad companies, while watering down stocks to the investors. Despite these practices, railroads pioneered modern corporate management. Inventiveness itself created entire industries and enormous consumer demands. Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone in 1876. By 1900, over 800,000 budding sweethearts around the U.S. were able to call each other and whisper sweet nothings through the phone line. Thomas Edison, the so-called wizard of the Gilded Age, produced a flood of ingenious inventions, beginning with the telegraphic machine, then the phonogram, the dictaphone, and finally, the beloved light bulb. These inventions earned him financial backing, and by the 1890s, Edison's company produced the first crude motion pictures. Other wonders, like the airplane and the first automobile, would emerge at the turn of the century. A great example of rags to riches is that of Andrew Carnegie. He came to America from Scotland at age 12 and worked in a textile mill. From there, he worked for Western Union, where he learned Morse code and business tactics. By 17, he was a secretary for a major railroad company, and by 23, he took his boss's place. During the next six years of his life, he applied cost-benefit and efficiency analysis to increase the size of the railroad. By 1870, he was very rich and moved into the steel business, becoming a ruthless businessman. 
He joined price fixing pools, undersold his rivals, and acquired them after they went bankrupt. By 1881, he owned most of the iron ore mines in Minnesota. Finally, in 1901, he retired. He sold his business to J.P. Morgan for half a billion dollars, making him richer than modern-day Bill Gates. He spent his retirement years doing what every wealthy retired man did in that era, donating his time to philanthropy. Many industries followed the same paths as Carnegie. John B. Rockefeller became the juggernaut of the American oil industry. Powerful tycoons formed giant trusts to monopolize the production of goods that were in high demand. Both businessmen were great examples of two business strategies. Rockefeller practiced horizontal integration where he owned all of his competitors and Carnegie practiced vertical integration where he owned all the stages of production. With these integrations came price fixing which caused the government to pass laws such as the Interstate Commerce Act and others to protect consumers from unfair business practices. Sears and Roebuck and Montgomery Ward became popular department stores and made purchasing accessible to all by sending out magazines, starting the shop from home revolution. It was a time evidenced by advertisement, wealth, and economic boom. Along with this boom, the struggle of organized labor emerged. Organized labor did not fare nearly as well as big businesses during the Gilded Age, as most Americans distrusted labor unions during the era. The first large-scale union, the National Labor Union, was formed just after the end of the Civil War in 1866. Workers created the union to protect skilled and unskilled workers in both rural and urban communities, but the union collapsed after the Depression of 1873. Later, the Knights of Labor represented skilled and unskilled workers, as well as blacks and women in the 1870s, but it also folded after being wrongfully associated with the Haymarket Square bombing in 1886. Despite these setbacks for organized labor, workers continued to strike or temporarily stop working for better wages, hours, and working conditions. The most notable strikes of this era were the Great Railroad Strike, the Homestead Strike, and the Pullman Strike, all of which ended violently. The more exclusive American Federation of Labor, or AFL, emerged as the most powerful union in the late 1880s. One cannot talk about business in the Gilded Age without mentioning politics. An oligarchy existed and those with wealth and power easily bought their politicians. The U.S. Senate was known as the bosses because of the disturbing trend toward the concentration of industry to the point of monopoly and its undue influence on politics. The 1880s and the 1890s were years of turbulence. Disputes erupted over labor relations, currency, tariffs, patronage, and railroads. The most momentous political conflict of the late 19th century was the farmer's revolt. Drought, plagues of grasshoppers, boll weevils, rising costs, falling prices, and high interest rates made it increasingly difficult to make a living as a farmer. Many farmers blamed railroad owners, grain elevator operators, land monopolists, commodity futures dealers, mortgage companies, merchants, bankers, and manufacturers of farm equipment for their plight. Farmers responded by organizing granges, farmers' alliances, and the Populist Party. The Populists called for a national income tax, cheaper money, also known as cheap silver, shorter work days, single term limits for presidents, immigration restrictions, and government control of railroads. The Gilded Age was an economic dark cloud that had its silver lining. For years, critics bashed the business strategies that allowed big industrialists to build powerful monopolies, but those monopolies brought desperately needed order to America's economic system. Those same critics also resented the immense fortunes of personal wealth that a handful of big businessmen were able to acquire. But that wealth paid for a huge surge in philanthropy, building hundreds of libraries, schools, museums, and other public facilities still enjoyed by the American people even today.
As profits soared, so did the American standard of living. During the latter half of the 19th century, millions of Americans left their farms and moved to the cities, which were filled with new wonders like skyscrapers, electric trolleys, and light bulbs. Nearly a million Eastern and Southern European immigrants arrived in America each year, settling primarily in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Chicago. Lady Liberty welcomed ships carrying immigrants seeking the fortunes the U.S. had to offer. What they did not know was the hardships they would endure in the U.S. These new immigrants crowded into the poorest neighborhoods, the city's crime and disease-ridden slums, and worked in sweatshop factories just to survive. Political machine bosses like William, Boss, Tweed, and New York preyed on immigrants, promising them public works projects and social services in exchange for their votes. Thankfully, a growing middle class spurred a late 19th century reform movement to reduce poverty and improve society. Reformer Jane Addams, for example, founded Whole House in Chicago to help the poor immigrant families adjust to life in America. The success of Whole House prompted other reformers to build similar settlement houses in the immigrant-clogged cities of the eastern United States. Muckraking journalist Jacob Rees helped capture the horrid conditions of the inner cities, also helping to bring attention of the poor to the middle and upper class societies. By this time, the progressive movement was taking shape, supported by a growing middle class, urban-oriented, educated people, including educators, journalists, ministers, and politicians for whom reform was a winning issue. Progressive were reformers, not revolutionaries. They believed in efficiency, honesty, and applying practical knowledge to solve public issues. The majority were native-born and Protestant. One enduring legacy of the time was the split between religious modernist and fundamentalist. Charles Darwin's introduction of his theory of evolution cast doubt on interpretations of biblical texts, causing many to reinterpret Christian ethics in modern society. How the Bible was read became a burning issue. Does one take it literally or metaphorically? From then on, the struggles between the fundamentalist and the modernist gripped the Protestant church. A social gospel was preached. It taught sin was not personal, but societal, and to be saved, one must help the poor. It spilled over into the Catholic Church, arousing papal alarm about the errors of Americanism. During this time, even Jews felt the strains of progressivism and the split into reform, conservative, and orthodox. They modified dietary rules and reformed synagogues that supported social reform. Fundamentalists became more prominent in the rural Midwest and the South, forming a rift between those regions and the modernists leading the North. These rifts still exist today. At the turn of the century, African Americans not only resisted racist scorn, but also laid foundations for the 20th century civil rights movement. In segregated black communities, leaders such as Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois would go on to birth infamous Tuskegee Institute and the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. At the top of the social and religious chains were the wealthy. The Carnegies, Rockefellers, and Vanderbilts accredited God for their acquired wealth and declared it that it was their job as a Christian to accumulate wealth and to heavily support social Darwinism, which was founded by economist Herbert Spencer. He coined the term survival of the fittest and did not support any intervention in helping the poor because to him, doing so would be futile. Carnegie wrote the gospel of wealth that proclaimed Anglo-Saxons to be superior, inequality was inevitable, and that the wealthy should act as trustees for their poorer brethren. The Gilded Age generated an upsurge of art, the construction of massive skyscrapers, and ornate mansions. Art filled lavish homes with European paintings, statues, and tapestries. The newspapers were filled with caricature art and advertisements that everyone in society could appreciate. The mansions built were elaborate with massive towers, bay windows, gothic paneling, wood floors, 
carved staircases and anything that sparkled. Some included indoor swimming pools, bowling alleys, and spacious ballrooms. In the cities, skyscrapers began to fill the city along with well-manicured city parks. The art was inspired by the European Victorian age, and the wealthy made sure that they spent as much as possible to surround themselves to confer the feeling that they were the royalty of the U.S. The Gilded Age was a dynamic age of incredible economic opportunity, just as it was a harsh era of incredible economic exploitation. It was a time filled with industrial boom, urbanization, and progressivism. Despite positive and negative outcomes that occurred during this era, if one looks closely, the evidence is clear that the Gilded Age transformed the United States into the modern era we enjoy today.